In the number one bestseller of all time, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Could a piece of what is greater be the greater community of good that exists all around us? Two guys who didn't know each other yet shared a common good and a common faith set out together to see what they might learn about the greater community. By traveling from Miami, Florida to Seattle, Washington with no money, no transportation, just community. They traveled to see if the community actually exists of greater good, greater mercy, and greater love. This is the story of their journey, a journey to find something greater. From the start of the trip, we wanted to be reliant on the faith community as much as possible. So we didn't publicize that we were attempting to travel cross country. But when friends or family asked us about summer plans, we told them about our trip. Kendall was one of our friends who heard about what we were doing, and although she lives six hours away in Orlando, she wanted to meet us at the airport in Miami as soon as we landed. Yo, yo, yo! Hi, Kendall. Nice to meet you. as well. Everywhere we went, we asked the Christians who helped us two questions. How did you come to faith? And what does faith look like in your life? What is faith to you? Like, if, you could... if I had to like name it? Describe it, anything. Like, what is faith to you? Like, when you think of faith. Yeah, when I think of faith, I think mostly of just the people who have it. Uh, red light. That's a red light. <laughs> With one leg of the trip completed, we were passed off to Jake, who has a strong background in faith since he's a preacher's son. However, Jake's faith rarely led to action until he was in college, when a friend named Spencer sat him down and pointed out how Jake's lifestyle was far from what Christians are called to. Perfect imagery of faith to me is what God did for us um, by dying on the cross. Um, if we're not able to do that for him, then faith, faith is it's, it's a facade, there's nothing. You know, at the root of our core, if we're not able to die for him, then, you know, what are we holding on to? We're lost, man. We're in the heart of the jungle right now. This is 42 minutes away. Whoa. Let me see what mine says. 42 minutes away? Where'd you take us? <laughs> I don't know, man. I went to the address. <laughs> oh, my God. What? Where is this place? <laughs> Dude, where's my phone taking us, man? That's the funniest thing in the oh, world. My Gosh. Hey, you still want to do, Doug? I appreciate it. No, I appreciate you. Oh, man. After they helped us find the apartment, it was a home cooked meal, which is exactly what we needed after a long first day. Then they shared their stories of faith. When we're told, like, my grace is sufficient, you know, kind of there's a little bit of a, a moment of, of fear when you hear that because it's like, okay, if if his grace is sufficient, then that means that like everything else could be taken away and like will be, you know, but that's fine. It's a nice early morning, <laughs> day two. I don't even know what to think anymore. The people we interviewed in Mount Dora all mentioned the faith of a teacher in the community named Carrie Hadley. We decided we had to visit Carrie in his natural habitat, Mount Dora Christian Academy. It's like no matter how you feel, you just keep trusting and doing, you know. You don't trust your feelings, you trust in God. Yeah. So you have to continue to tell yourself, I have to continue to tell myself, okay, don't trust the feelings, you know, trust, trust the promise of God. And no matter how you're feeling about it right now, walk through it. What faith looks like to me. Um, I'll say this analogy that Dr. Youngblood sort of said in our Old Testament class, and it's something I tell my kids. There was a Boy Scout troop with this group of boys who were going camping and they were going to have to go across this really old rickety bridge that like swayed, you know, over this canyon. It just looked really sketchy. And nobody obviously wanted to go across it, but they had to to get to their campsite. Like that's where they were supposed to be for the night. It looked like nobody had been there in years. Eventually, one brave kid stepped up and went across the bridge. Slowly, just over time, and he eventually made it. And it took forever, but he did, he did it. And after that, after he went across, 
Each kid one by one went across two and they all made it across the bridge safely. Did the bridge get stronger after that boy went across? And the answer is no. Their faith got stronger. And he's like, that bridge is like the way that God is. God never changes, just like that bridge did not change um, in its structure or its strength. A weak faith and a strong bridge will get you across. So a lot, that first kid who went was obviously so scared. And maybe more and more kids gained faith over time after they saw more people, more people go across. But that bridge didn't change, like its capability to get that boy across. The boy's faith, which was so small, still did the job. Keep in mind that no matter where your faith is at, you can still get somewhere. You look at a guy like Carrie Hadley or a girl like Rachel Gosser and wonder, how many people have they left an impact on through school, church, and just life? Next, we went to Gainesville to see another person who sits in a large position of influence, University of Florida Athletic Director Scott Strickland. You know, when I think of faith, I think of doing something that makes you uncomfortable because you know that you're going to be okay on the other side. I don't see how people go through life without a rock to stand on. I just don't see how you do it with all the challenges that we all face on a day-to-day -day basis. Scott is a guy that continually steps out of his comfort zone whenever the opportunity to act in faith presents itself. God has blessed him because of that, and both his career and position of influence has grown. Today he works with an annual budget of $120 million operating over the school's athletic programs. But that is an extremely rare case. After Gainesville, Rachel Gosser bought us a bus ticket to get up to Atlanta, where we witnessed the opposite end of the spectrum. Jacob and I sat on the very back row of the bus, and we soon found out that we were the only two people on the back three rows who had not had their life derailed by a stint in prison. We met a man named Malachi who was a believer. He was kicked out of the house at 12 years old because his mother had too many kids to take care of. Now, Malachi has a four-year-old daughter who is autistic and deaf. He's been working on getting his GED and was on a 26-hour bus ride to surprise his mom in Ohio for Mother's Day. But not everyone on the Greyhound shared the same faith. The next group of people we spoke with were kind. In fact, they offered us pizza. But when the conversation shifted to Christianity, there was a noticeable lack of hope in their voices. One said, We've become such an evil race that God has left us. Another quickly pointed out all the times pastors and congregations focused entirely on money and buildings, which left people in need lost behind new church programs or under construction signs. These people have legitimate doubts, sometimes aided by personal experiences. These comments were all valid. You can't deny the pain the world brings to people through homelessness, heartbreaking loss of family by death or divorce, chronic poverty, financial tension, and fear of what's going to hit you next. You can't survive unless you have a true family there with you. We arrived in Atlanta exhausted by the day's travel. I'm so hungry, dude. Also, I feel how heavy this bag is. Thankfully, Cooper Thompson, someone I consider a brother, was there to pick us up. We're gonna get nice and cozy. <laughs> We woke up the next morning with a renewed sense of vigor and got on the road to Nashville, hoping to spend some more time in fellowship with others. <laughs> on the way, we made a pit stop in Chattanooga at the Frothy Monkey to see a couple of our friends. My dad was in prison until I was nine years old. Um, he got out and his life was completely changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And faith to me is loving others and serving others and showing compassion to those who are really difficult to show love to all the time. I've seen that so much in my life, especially through my dad just working in prison ministry. Faith is believing in something greater and that we don't have to worry about anything because mountains still move every day. We had some delicious gumbo at the Lost Cajun. Its owner, Rob Estrada, heard our story and wanted to help out, so he covered our meal. I mean, it's, it's people helping other people. Through Facebook Live, we invited anyone who wanted to talk to us about faith to come have a cup of coffee. We sat in the Well Coffee Shop, hoping people of faith would pay us a visit. As the rain fell outside, people of all stages of life began pouring in, eager to discuss faith. The people that you see that have faith, what does that look like? Real. Real. Uh, it 
something that can bind communities together. And you can see it in times of suffering when people come together. You can see it in times of triumph when people come together as well, uh, when people glorify God. And uh, you can't always necessarily feel it. It's not always tangible, uh, but it's just something that you can experience. And then all of a sudden one day you wake up and I guess you have a bunch of children and a wife and, and faith looks different because it's not just you and God anymore. There's sort of this additional lens that you're looking through when you're saying, okay, well now it's me and my spouse. And so it's, yes, there's a me and God time that I have to think about, but there's also a how do I think about God in relation to my wife? Or now, how do I think about God in relation to my children? And what am I doing that is leaving lasting impressions on them? Not just teaching them, oh, here's what the Bible says and here's what uh, God is like, but little things that leave implicit sort of marks on them where they say, oh, that's what faith looks like. We finished a great day with fireworks and one final conversation with the Weeks family. Faith is uh, living that life that is going to be different and having the confidence that uh, there is a better way to live and then there's something better waiting for you. At the end of the day, you're going to have to say, I, I choose to have faith. Remember who you are. In Nashville to Huntsville, we got a ride with Luke Smith and Nature Dave Cox. Both of these guys can't help but be outdoors, enjoying the views creation has to offer while using their abilities to create new things. Nature Dave can point to a specific moment at a waterfall that was so beautiful that it took his worries away, firmly rooted his trust in God, and he found unexplainable joy. Through nature, I found that God put his love in nature, and I've got love from nature to put into other people. That's kind of how I found God and how the perspective of my life kind of changed from then on. In Huntsville, we got to meet the Denton family. After lunch, they were willing to sit down and share about faith and the ways it plays out in their lives. I think of the song, Faith is a Victory, Oh Glorious Victory. Recently, we sat down and did some will planning with my father, and he filled out a living will. And he was able to say, to have the faith enough to say that when the time comes and he's at the point of death, he's ready to go. He didn't, he didn't want any extra life-saving measures. To me, that was just, that was an example of a lot of faith, to be able to say that. He is ready, he's lived a life, and he's ready to go on and see God. I don't know, like going through like chemistry and biology just really helped me realize like it's not all by chance and it's not all by accident and just realizing like there's such an intricate design in everything there and that's just really been a huge faith builder this past year. Right here? Right here. Pull right in. Yep. Okay. Your Family plays a big role for someone it comes to faith. The spiritual leader in my family, for as long as I can remember, has been my grandfather, Bailey Howell. He's been an elder at the Starkville Church of Christ for a very long time. But he's most well known for his 11-year NBA career, which led to an enshrinement in the National Basketball Hall of Fame in 1997. He has two world titles and a never-ending strain of stories from his playing days. He played for the first black head coach in major American sports history in 1966 when Bill Russell became player coach. Although racism was alive in public at that time, Howell took the scriptural response to racism and made it his public statement. Quote, I had always been taught we're all the same. And if I believe what scripture says, it's true. You realize that God has blessed you with certain talents and he expects you to develop them to your fullest. Although Starkville has become her home, Abby is moving with her family nine hours away before her senior year of high school. Making new friends and leaving her tight-knit youth group is a big challenge, but Abby is choosing to lean on God day by day. There's a plan for your life, and even if you don't know where you're heading or like why you're going somewhere or like why something's happening, that there is a reason, and it's all laid out in a plan, and you don't have to worry about anything, and it's going to go the way that God wants it to go. Faith is a, I think it's a daily thing, and it's a, uh, choosing to uh, to live for the kingdom and to not be
be caught up and pulled away by the flashy things of this world. It's so much uh, comes down to choosing, you know, are we going to choose this world or will I choose what it is to be part of the kingdom? We had the privilege of attending the wedding of my beautiful friends, Corey and Melissa. When you talk about community, the divine bond of marriage is a God-given example. Corey even took some time on his wedding day to talk to us about faith. Faith is the thing that makes my life what it is. You know, I think every person, no matter uh, Christian or not, lives with some kind of faith in something. And to me, that faith is in Jesus, and uh, that gives me uh, a hope to hold on to, um, someone to emulate. Um, it gives me a community of people to love. Uh, faith is the best thing in my life. Kaylin? McKaylin. McKaylin, okay. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Cool. Come on, D-Town Boogie on. God himself has undertaken to teach us love. All that we can add to it is to remember this divine instruction and excel in it more and more every day. When God was merciful to us, we learned to show mercy to others. When we received forgiveness instead of judgment, we too were made ready to forgive. What God did for us, we owe to those those same gifts. Faith looks to me like knowing that in every situation and everything that's going on, he is going to take care of you. Because the trip took place at breakneck speed, we had no time to spare looking for someone to drive us when we got to each destination. To stay ahead of the game, we tried to have a ride set up usually a day or two in advance. Our buddy Hunter in Denver has a trucking company that was going to put us on one of his big rigs headed to Las Vegas. However, on the way to Dallas, we got word that no truck was leaving on the day we needed. Finding someone to drive us one way 12 hours is a stressful venture. While Jacob and I were reaching out to any Christian contact we could find between Denver and Las Vegas, Michaela picked up her Jacob, phone. Do you think we could buy Jacob and Ben tickets from Denver to Vegas? I know, this is such a big help, such a big help for us. Thank you so much. Day six of our trip, and we are in the wonderful place, Dallas, Texas. We'll be sitting uh, at the park, right outside the Frisco Public Library. From four to seven, we'd love for you guys to come out to the park, talk to us about faith, and uh, hope to see you soon. I think that if I do my best to be Jesus, to be like Jesus for the people in this community, then God is using me. You know, that faith looks like that here. The faith looks like faithful people living in the community, not necessarily knowing what they're supposed to do, but doing what Jesus would do. When I can't handle life, God kind of takes it from me and, I don't know, it gives you peace and understanding even when you don't, when it doesn't make sense. To me, faith looks like just the community and like just the body of Christ. Some people neither of us had met before wanted to be a part of the project. They were already making the long haul from Dallas to Denver and they were open to add two strangers in the back seat. We weren't even really sure what Derek and Kristen looked like or were driving, but hey, Jacob and I didn't really know each other before the trip anyway. Hello. Welcome, how are you? I'm good. I'm Delilah. Jacob. It means to just love him and love his people, and that's all he asks of us. And I think Satan is so stinking good at distracting us with all this extra stuff in our lives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good part. <laughs> okay, good. And so, uh, for most for most guys, and when whenever they're growing up, I uh, I think they most guys get into pornography, and um, I got into pornography as well, and and, um, and that was like a huge. Um, a huge darkness in my life and a huge um, cloud of darkness that, that just overwhelmed me constantly and I was trying to serve two masters, the, the master of God and uh, the master of, of sex. But Derek's youth minister 
poured into his life, faithfully present, and became the first male figure to ever be a solid role model to Derek. Through that, it really encouraged me to choose a, a route of ministry, and, and, um, and that's why I decided to like find a Bible school that taught youth ministry and, um, and taught just how to pour into to youth and youth culture because I wanted to give back to God um, in the same way that He had given back to me. Both Derek and Kristen have stories of faith that highlight how community works to change our hearts and put lives back on track to goodness. It takes more courage than we realize to be frank with people and ask for help. The simple action of being in community is often spoiled because we're afraid for no reason. The whole problem with the lack of trust in others is not a lack of goodness or understanding of others. It's a lack of love. If we only loved each other, we would have no problem trusting each other. Once we arrived in Denver, we had a few friends to see before calling it a day. My family fell apart in college, so um, it wasn't until then that I really, I think, valued that faith and actually needed it. That sounds horrible, but I didn't really um, I guess I kind of took it for granted and it was just kind of something that was there. Um, but it wasn't until my parents got divorced that I really felt like this is all I have right now and this is what is not going to fall apart and it's forever and it's constant. Um, so yeah, ever since then I've, I've had a realization that God is everything and is never going to go away. And I came to faith um, at camp when I experienced honestly I experienced frustration with God and I talked to him about it and that was the first time my prayer wasn't like oh here's this list of things that I always pray and it was like oh you're real I'm talking to you like you're real. The Christian community in Denver just like everywhere else we had visited is active and loving. Walking downtown I randomly bumped into Scott Light my seventh grade youth intern. Scott was one of the first people who ever taught me that that faith can be fun that having fun is actually a spiritual discipline. It's like a lens, you know, like in terms of metaphor, like it's, it's either the foundation that I'm standing on is the premise with which I, I don't know, approach anything I need to think about. It was weird looking back at my life and seeing like, how did I exist without like a purpose? You know what I mean? Like how did I, how did I just live every single day and just live? You know, there was like, there was nothing behind why I was alive or anything like that, you know? And so it was just, it was really, I don't know how to describe it, but it was a really weird feeling. Uh, faith is more of a fluid thing, and it's more um, about actions, too. Uh, actions as far as interacting with other people. All right, baby, here we go. Here we go, here, here we, we go. go, here we go. Round three. First flight. We're getting a flight. So much better than a 12-hour car ride. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, open security screen. There's so much darkness in Las Vegas. But when someone shines their light in a place like that, it radiates like the sun, offering an undeniable and life-giving picture of hope. Carol is this example as a school teacher. When she was diagnosed with cancer and undergoing chemo, she said the refining fire of this experience made her spiritually stronger in the end. Her students and coworkers noticed her positive energy in the midst of a life or death struggle. And this, opened up the door for Carol to tell about her faith to people who wanted to know why she could be so strong. Well, it plays a big role considering the cancer survivor and it made a world of a difference that I take things more slowly. And if I feel like oh, I'm not really called to do that, it's that inner voice, you know, I'm like, okay, Lord. Or if I have a big decision to make, I'll let somebody know, give me 24 hours at least to pray on it. Yeah. Los Angeles is Jacob's home. His dad picked us up in Vegas and took us for dinner to meet Joyce, Jacob's third grade teacher and family friend. My faith began to grow, and it only grew because I was in the Word and on a daily basis. And that's what faith is, is a daily walk with the God. 
you know, you can always turn back to God. God's always there. He's waiting for you no matter what. And I think every time you do that, I think your faith gets stronger. Morale reached an all-time low. After three days of calling contacts in L.A., Malibu, and San Francisco, we still had no ride out of L.A. We even posted on Facebook begging for a ride, and it got dozens of shares, but still, no takers. There was no shortage of people reaching out to us to help, but nobody had what we needed. Transportation. Our trip has come to a halt. We have no idea how we can get to San Francisco by tomorrow. For the first time on the trip, we're just, we're hanging out. Sitting, relaxing. Finally, There's nowhere to be, nowhere to go. But then, the calls started rolling in. Well, uh, you got any, you got any good news for us? Yes? You have very good news for us. Awesome, thank you so much. You're, you saved the trip. <laughs> yes. Thank you. God bless. Going to San Fran. In just an hour, we had rides set up all the way to Portland. But not only did we have one path, multiple people called making sure we were covered offering to buy a bus or train tickets up the coast. Just when we thought the well was running dry, God's people provided more than we could even use. I knew Hunter Beck, a friend from college and someone I greatly respect, was willing to house us in Sacramento before driving us to Medford, Oregon the next day. But I was shocked when my childhood best friend, Seth Cantrell, got out of the car with him at midnight. Oh, what's up, guys? No oh. shot! <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? How are you? To describe what faith looks like, I guess, is people trying to do good or to help people really with no ulterior motive. Kelly Christopher took us hiking in beautiful Medford, Oregon, before driving us to our destination for the night, the Whiting's House in Portland. Honestly, like, I remember looking at other people. I remember looking at Christians and, and being in church and thinking, you know, I guess like kind of longing for it almost, like longing to be a part of something um, bigger, you know, something worth fighting for, something, you know, everlasting or like ancient of days, if you will. The bottom line is I feel strongly that our purpose here on earth is to glorify God and glorify Christ. For the first time on the trip, Jacob and I went to worship in a corporate setting. Worship is not about getting chills or shedding tears, but both were experienced in that moment. The highest position and greatest potential of mankind is found in worship of God. It's what we're made for. And so I think for me, a lot of faith in Jesus is faithfulness to Jesus. Faith for me has been a lot of acceptance when I feel like I haven't deserved it. And instead of people, like even when I tried to burn as many bridges as I could, people did not turn their backs on me. Uh, people accepted me for who I am and what I've become and what I will become in the future. Um, and that's been a great relief for me to understand. I think faith is something that I've always kind of sought in my life, but also like thought in my life and discovered and then rediscovered and lost. But I think that it's always given me peace and um, like a purpose in my life. And so that's what I always come back to with faith. And just like that, we were rolling into Seattle. After only 13 days, we had traveled 4,000 593 miles in the car in 94 hours and 45 minutes. That's almost four days in the car and an average of 328 miles per day. All of that not including our combined 3,447 miles flown to Miami and from Denver to Las Vegas. But this incredible journey, during which we had been helped by 113 different Christians, wasn't over just yet. I mean, we have a day to spare, so can we get to Vancouver? I'm happy to help get you guys there. Yeah, well, of course. That's awesome. We found countless success stories of people who, 
in the midst of their struggles or heartbreaks, chose to dig deeper into the community instead of trying to numb or manage their pain. We were changed by those faithful people who turned to God's community to share their burdens, to walk alongside them, and to find peace once again, kneeling in worship before the throne of God. I had a professor named Ken Neller that had this mystical ability to get your attention and keep it. One day he started class by bragging about his wealth and all the houses he owns across the world. Greece, Atlanta, South Africa, Hawaii, New York City, London, Seattle, and various other places around the world. Then he told us the reason why he had this great wealth. Christian brothers and sisters had opened their houses to him. The wealth of the people who cared for him through the love of Christ is truly a treasure. Now, I've seen the same in my life. Truth is, throughout our project, we had hundreds more people itching to help us, begging us to swing by their house, to spend the night, or just to share a meal and fellowship. Life is more fun when spent with a loving community, but the continuing narrative of those we talk to of being sustained in difficult times by God and His people testifies that the community is greater than a country club. Its bonds run deep, able to offer true healing in the face of unspeakable tragedy. It's a divine transformation, and it reminds us that God is present when we gather together. The invitation is open to anyone, and there is an abundance of blessings waiting for those who choose God's greater community.